Okay. Hey, you guys. So we are talking cellular energy. Um, I'm going to quickly flip through some things that we've already covered just in review because you guys will have a test coming up for me at the end of not this coming week, but the week following. So we'll go through this. That way you have it in front of you if you need to listen back. So in terms of energy, we know that energy is the ability for an organism to do work and all living things require some form of energy. So whether that's um, a chemical energy or solar energy in the case of photosynthetic organisms, they need to be able to utilize energy to create sugars, which will then be transformed um, into ATP energy, which is something that our bodies can readily use and store. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It's a nucleic acid, um, and it is the most important chemical energy for living organisms, um, specifically cells. ATP has three major components. It has an adenine molecule, ribose, sugar, and then three phosphates. And those phosphates are really important, not because of the phosphate itself, but because of the bonds that hold the phosphates together. So those creation of those bonds, those bonds are energy storing. So if you add a bond, you store more energy. If you break a bond though, you're able to release that energy and the body can then use it to do a job. When you break that bond down, you're going to go from ATP, T meaning tri or three, into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. That di means two because now you only have two phosphates and a free floating phosphate off in the cellular environment. ADP is still super useful, but it is less energetic than ATP. But the fact that we can go from ATP to ADP and back again means that we have an energy cycle that is really easy to use within living things. So again, more phosphate bonds equals more energy, and that whole cycle is going to look a little something like this. So break the bond, release energy, add the bond back in, and you're going to store energy up. So two types of organisms in terms of energy. You can be a heterotroph or an autotroph. Things that are autotrophs make their own energy. These are things like chemosynthetic um, organisms and photosynthetic organisms. In our case for this class, we're talking about photosynthesis right now. So photosynthetic organisms like plants that can take in solar energy, use it to create their own sugars, and then those sugars can be used to generate ATP. You and I are heterotrophs, as are most animals. So heterotrophic organisms are going to have to eat sugars and get that glucose through their diet that they can then put into cellular respiration to generate ATP. So photosynthesis happens in autotrophs and you're taking in sun energy and using it to create eventually ATP through the middleman, which is glucose sugar. So here's your equation for photosynthesis. So if you're a plant, you need a couple of different things. We know they need sunlight, they need carbon dioxide, and they need water. Put those things together and you can generate glucose and oxygen as a byproduct, which is pretty cool because later we'll talk about cellular respiration and what you'll notice is the equation for cellular respiration is actually the exact opposite of the equation of photosynthesis, which means there's a great relationship between autotrophs and heterotrophs because autotrophs generate the things that heterotrophs need and heterotrophs generate some of the things that autotrophs need because we know that when we respirate or breathe, we are breathing in oxygen and breathing out carbon dioxide, whereas my photosynthetic organisms are taking in carbon dioxide and generating oxygen then as their byproduct. So it's a pretty cool little relationship there. <clears throat> so location of photosynthesis happens in organelles called chloroplasts. And those chloroplasts are essentially little pillows and pockets of chlorophyll and pigments that are able to absorb solar energy and use it in the process of photosynthesis to generate glucose. So this diagram is an image of what the inside of a chloroplast would look like. So it has two membranes, an outer and an inner membrane. In between the two is something called the intramembrane space. And it is filled with stacks of pigment filled discs and those discs are called thylakoids and they're like little flat bags full of chlorophyll and other solar absorbing pigments. 
if you stack those up, it creates a granum or a grana. And the inside of it is referred to as the lumen or the space in between, right? And then surrounding it is going to be a jelly-like fluid space, which is called the stroma. And photosynthesis has two major phases. It has the light-dependent reaction and the light-independent reaction, which is also sometimes called the Calvin cycle. And they happen in different places within your chloroplast. So your light-dependent reaction, which obviously depends on solar energy, is going to happen in these thylakoids because that's where your chlorophyll is. And the chlorophyll is what is actually able to absorb solar energy. So that's light-dependent. Light independent doesn't have to rely on this chlorophyll anymore, and so it actually happens out in the stroma or the space outside of the, uh, the thylakoid. So here are those two um, stages for you, light dependent and light independent. And again, it just goes back to the concept of light dependent involves these light absorbing pigments, happens in the thylakoids, and the light independent reaction is now no longer in need of light in order to take place. So this can happen out in the stroma. <clears throat> so if you look at this picture, this is very similar to the diagram that I made a brief video about for you guys and posted last week. So please refer back to that if you need to. But the main thing I need you to see from this is the two phases of photosynthesis and what goes into and comes out of each. So we have something called reactants and something called products in any chemical reaction that you have. And this is a chemical reaction. So the things that go into it are your reactants. In this case, any arrows pointing into a location. So focus on the granum stack, the thylakoids for me. You can see the yellow arrows of the sunlight pointing in. You can see water going into it. So these are types of things that are going to go into the light dependent reaction. You can also see NADP plus, which is an energy carrier. And ADP, which we know from our ATP cycle, is going to get transformed into ATP. This all happens in the light-dependent reaction. And then you're going to generate a little bit of ATP, a energy carrier that now actually has a hydrogen on it. And then you're going to go into your Calvin cycle, which is now out in the stroma. Notice that it's no longer happening in one of those granum stacks. Carbon dioxide is then going to come in. You're going to use the um, H from the NADPH and the ATP energy to help you generate glucose sugar, which we'll get to later on. That sugar actually goes to the mitochondria and gets used um, to be, uh, is used then to generate more ATP through cellular respiration. Um, so as you look at this, focus on those reactants and the products. And something that I really want you to notice here is oftentimes people will assume that oxygen is obviously created from CO2 and that's false. You don't get your oxygen from the breakdown of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide doesn't come into play until the light independent reaction. The oxygen is actually created through the breakdown of water. That solar energy is so high powered that it breaks apart water molecules to take apart the hydrogens and use those to make NADPH. And that O2 from the H2O is gonna go off on its own as a byproduct. So now the new stuff. We're talking cellular respiration. So this is something that happens in all living things for the most part. Um, heterotrophs and autotrophs alike. Whereas autotrophs are the only organisms undergoing photosynthesis, heterotrophs are undergoing cellular respiration. And so are autotrophs. So before we get into that, it's important for us to think about something called aerobic and anaerobic processes. If something is aerobic, it involves or happens in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic processes do not require oxygen, okay? So keep that in mind as we move forward. So obviously living things that can't make their own food have to get glucose through their diet. So now we're assuming that we've either made that glucose as an autotroph through photosynthesis or we have gotten glucose through eating, okay? Okay. So now we're going to use that glucose and we're going to take it and transform it into ATP energy. Oftentimes people ask me the question, well, I, made a, I could have made a little bit of ATP through photosynthesis. Why didn't I just stop there? And the answer is it only makes a little bit. 
If you take that little bit and you donate it into cellular respiration, you're going to make a whole lot more. So more bang for your buck kind of a thing. Okay. So equation for cellular respiration, we talked about that a bit when we looked at photosynthesis and you can see it down in the picture in the bottom right corner for you. They're the exact opposites, which kind of highlights that cool relationship between the reactants of one equation being the products of the next one. So cellular respiration takes place in and around the mitochondria. There are three steps to cellular respiration, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Two of them actually happen in the mitochondria. One of them happens just outside. So when you're thinking about your types of cells that would undergo cellular respiration, be very careful because only one phase happens outside of the mitochondria, which means that one phase, glycolysis, is the only thing that prokaryotic cells can do because they don't have membrane-bound organelles and the mitochondria is a membrane-bound organelle. So there are going to be different versions of cellular respiration depending on the type of cell or organism that you are. So here's our three phases, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain, and they happen in that order. So glycolysis takes the glucose and turns it into something that then feeds into the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle generates something necessary for electron transport, and electron transport is where you're going to make that mass amount of ATP in the end. So if you look at that graphic off on the right-hand side, you can see glycolysis is making two ATP. Krebs cycle is making two ATP. Electron transport, if I make it all the way to the end, I'm making 32 ATP. So that's going to be a way bigger power surge there for me than if I just stopped after glycolysis. <clears throat> so glycolysis is the only anaerobic stage of cellular respiration, meaning this is the one that can occur without oxygen. So organisms that are anaerobic can still do glycolysis. Prokaryotes can also still do glycolysis because it doesn't happen inside the mitochondria. It happens out in the cytoplasm. So in this process, you're going to take glucose and break it down into something called pyruvic acid, a little bit of ATP, and then a couple of energy molecules. But the ATP, the pyruvic acid, and those energy molecules, they're going to be used up in order to generate more stuff towards the end. That then feeds into the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle. Um, it was named after the guy who discovered it. His last name was Krebs. <laughs> um, and then this is essentially only happening in our eukaryotic cells because this is the first phase of cellular respiration that is actually happening in the mitochondria. And it specifically happens in the matrix of the mitochondria. So that central kind of space in the mitochondria. And this is then going to take the stuff that was made in glycolysis, that pyruvic acid, um, some ATP and energy carriers, and then make it into more ATP, CO2, and more energy carriers. Then all of this goes into electron transport chain, which happens across the mitochondrial membrane. If you remember, back when we talked about cellular organelles, we specifically talked about the structure of the mitochondria and how it has this cool, almost looks like mustard on a hot dog kind of shape. That cool squiggly design is called cristae. And it's essentially an extension of the cellular mem or the mitochondrial membrane, which creates more surface area. And the way the electron transport chain works is it pumps electrons back and forth using something called ATP synthase across the mitochondrial membrane. And every time you're doing this pumping back and forth motion, you're generating ATP. So the more surface area you have, the more ATP you're able to generate, which kind of explains this physical shape and form of the mitochondria a little bit. So you're going to make 34 ATP through this whole process plus some water byproduct. So here's a slide kind of talking about that cool cristae shape of the mitochondria. And then it brings you to this lovely chart, which I am telling you up front right now, you will see on your test. Granted, your test is open notes, so I would suggest you write this down somewhere. Um, but this is breaking down for you the three phases of cellular respiration, where it happens, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, what does it make, and kind of a basic overview of what it does. So glycolysis, cytoplasm. It's the only anaerobic phase, it's the only one that prokaryotes can do, and it's going to make us two ATP and some pyruvic acid. Krebs cycle, mitochondrial matrix, aerobic process, 
making a little more ATP, making some energy carriers and CO2. Electron transport chain across the membrane of the mitochondria. It is aerobic, meaning does happen in the presence of oxygen, 34 ATP and some water. Okay. So those are um, the basic rundown of the cellular respiration steps. I'm not asking you guys to get crazy detailed with this, just to have a general idea of the process. Last thing we're going to talk about is called fermentation. So what does an organism do if it needs to make ATP and it cannot deal with oxygen? It is an anaerobic organism. I'm talking prokaryotes here. So when you don't have oxygen, your only option is glycolysis. You can't do Krebs cycle. You can't do the ETC, only glycolysis. So how do you make that ATP? And the answer is something called fermentation. Fermentation is the anaerobic version of glycolysis. And it's a way for them to make ATP when oxygen is not available or it can't be used. So basically it allows for the electrons produced in glycolysis to go back into pyruvic acid and essentially restart glycolysis over and over and over as a never ending loop. So glycolysis forever. Two different ways, you can have alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. If you wanted to make alcohol, alcoholic fermentation would do that for you. They actually sell something that is called like an alcohol brewing yeast. It's what they make beer with. And it produces alcohol as a waste product by doing this fermentation glycolysis over and over again. Another option is lactic acid fermentation. This is how they make things like cheese and buttermilk. Um, but also it's why your muscles hurt when you've worked out too much because you don't have enough oxygen to um, continue cellular respiration in your muscle cells. So it'll actually go into fermentation and just keep doing glycolysis in order to generate ATP. But in the process, you're making a lactic acid waste, which is building up in your muscles and causing that soreness and stiffness.